we were told not to talk about it. We were told not to even tell our spouses anything about it, which is nonsense. Most of us did. But we weren't supposed to talk about it ever. <laughs> okay? instantly by this incredible light followed within two or three nanoseconds by the second detonation of the second stage of the bomb, which created its own light, and then it gradually faded through some of the colors of the prism. A split second that lasts a thousand years, and then the white light, brighter than the desert sun, burns through jackets pulled across taut faces, burns through smoke gray eyes of grotesque masks, burns through pink tissue squinted shut, and burns a nightmare image on the retina. In the summer of 1957, along with 800 other Marines, I was sent from Camp Pendleton out to the Nevada test site to witness what turned out to be the largest atmospheric detonation ever exploded over America, 74 kilotons, about six times the size of the bomb we dropped on Hiroshima. Stand up and face ground zero. We went down there pretty, uh, pretty well scared shitless. I've been in the Marine Corps at that time for three and a half years. So my BS detector had pretty, pretty well honed. developed a policy called lead and hedge. Lead in nuclear weapons and hedge your bets. And one general said at the end of the review, he said, if you threaten our missiles and our early warning systems, he said, baby, that's threatening the family jewels. I didn't talk about it at all for another uh, almost 20 years, at all, uh, except to a doctor that diagnosed uh, me as being sterile in 1963. It was a very heavy scene uh, when I had to go home and tell my wife that we were not going to have the family that we wanted. I'm always interested in why. What's the cause of a disease? What's the etiology of this nuclear addiction that this country has? And I think it's in the midbrain, the, the midbrain of some males. And we have to suss out that pathology and treat those males as if they're medically contraindicated for the public health of the people of the planet. Rises floating through the torn sky. And then the winds begin, triggered by that great cloud of bile that personifies the eons of man's progress around the circle from cave to cave. I don't know like how you felt when like, you were down there. It was like all you could do is breathe, like you could just focus on your breathing the most times because you couldn't really focus on anything else. When I get in a situation like that, I tend to hyperventilate. So takes a conscious effort to slow down, breathe in, breathe out, particularly when you're wearing a gas mask. Yeah. That earth-consuming mushroom obscures the morning stars, blots out the sky, then rains back upon the glowing earth its man-concocted curse. The Morning Dove, a pornographic tale. Yucca Flat, 3.40 a.m., July 5th, 1957. 
jury rigged along a desert trench half a mile long, loudspeakers growl, Break ranks, enter the trench. And 800 pale marines crawl into trenches five feet deep, graves for innocence dug by machines designed to claw sewer lines. We stand within the trench, stand and shiver, stand and wait for the word, for the dawn, for 70 kilotons of fractured atoms. We're sitting around the campfire drinking wine and uh, there are about a dozen people still up about one o'clock in the morning. And somebody said, well, what should we do? And somebody else said, well, let's tell ghost stories. And I said, okay, well, let's tell ghost stories. One proviso, the ghost story has to be true. But I told the story of this dove that I had touched when we came up out of the trench. And John Orr said, Bird, you dumb son of a bitch, why isn't that a poem? <laughs> I placed my hands upon the ledge and twisted from the trench, just as the pale sun, not quite obscured by a gray scrim of atomic dust, rose above the far hills. But as my head rose above the ledge, my outstretched hand grasped the soft, spastic form. A dove blasted. A torn morning dove twitched. Spasm, spasm, sins black. Progress run amok. That dove's melted eyes oozed gray pus. And from a throat that had sung man awake since the dawn of time, bubbled a faint squeak, squeak. That mangled dove still smolders, radium etched upon my soul. In my twisted dreams, that squeaking dove again becomes the Holy Ghost, whose gray tears are shed for man, for homo ludens, whose mad games will someday self-destruct Well, when that poem came up, when I was telling that story, it uh, was as if it had unloosed something. And I haven't stopped writing, as you know, I haven't stopped writing about that since. <laughs>